Hello, my name is Mike Fallon. I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, Chuck Downer and Jeff Neiman. I have a lot of slides, so I'll just get right into it. Uh, this presentation starts with the background with the operational requirement that we had to simulate flows in the Helmand River Basin in Afghanistan. And we had issues with snow simulation. So therefore, we used the test basin in Colorado and made improvements on the snow simulation. And I'm going to show some of those results. So starting out, the, we were tasked with simulating flow within the Helmand River Basin. It's a very large basin, as you can see in the bottom right corner. Uh, it's about the size of Georgia, for spatial reference. The spring peak flows are dominated by snow melt, and the focus area of, that we had was in the upper Helmand River Basin, which is about the size of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. So our data sources were very limited. Uh, we had a land information system for hydrometeorology data, and we had some data to calibrate against uh, at the outlet of the upper Hellman River Basin. There's a reservoir, and we were able to back out uh, flow estimates. But uh, and the model that we were using was the gridded surface, subsurface hydrologic analysis model. Uh, it has a lot of abilities with infiltration, overland flow, channel flow, subsurface flow. Uh, one thing I'm going to mention here is usually when you run this model, it's using a 2D uh, groundwater. But uh, because this area is so large and there was not a lot of data, we used a, a linear reservoir type model. And the focus of this presentation is on the simple energy balance snow routine. So here's the simulation uh, within Afghanistan. This is the upper Helmand River Basin. As you can see, the, the lower elevations are gray, they don't have a whole lot of snow, and then when you get into the upper elevations, the dark blue, that's uh, heavy snowpack. And as, it, as the melting recedes up the basin, uh, the flow uh, responds. And so uh, each one of those little squares is one square kilometer, and so this is a very large basin. Uh, but when we look at the simulations compared to the reconstructed flow, we were accurate in the timing at the beginning and at the end, but in the middle we were quite a bit off. And so that led to the question, are we off because of the hydrometeorology data we're using from satellites, or are we off because of the model structure and the uh, simulation processes of the snow? So that led us to look at a test basin in Colorado, the Center Rebecca uh, Basin in Colorado. It's a smaller basin, but it has a lot of point data as well as spatial data sources. The hydrometeorology, there's three sites, two of them within the basin. They both have estimates of snow water equivalent and shortwave radiation. Uh, there's cloud cover data from uh, 16 kilometers away at the Telluride Regional Airport, and it had uh, good flow data at the outlet. Uh, one thing I'm going to mention with the spatial data sources is we had snow cover area estimates from Landsat imagery. We had about 31 images over about five year period. And we classified each cell as snow, no snow, or snow fringe. So when we ran the model, the initial model, uh, we looked at the Swamp Angel plot site, which is in the lower elevation site. Uh, it matched fairly well. Uh, so we were looking, it was looking promising. Then we looked at the upper elevation plot site, and we were missing uh, quite a bit. I mean, it, it's still not awful, but we, were, we definitely needed some improvement. So it was looking promising still. And then we looked at the outflow. And the outflow was awful. Uh, it was Nash Suit Cliff of negative 0.42. Uh, we were off on timing. We were off on uh, peak flows. And so we looked at the snow cover area. As you can see, we were simulating the basin as pretty much one big blob. We weren't accounting for any of the spatial variability within the basin. The observed snow cover areas on the left, uh, the dark is definitely snow, and then uh, likely snow and no snow. And then the uh, original snow water equivalent simulations are on the right. So we, we took a step back and went back to the energy equation that we were using. And here's the snow energy balance. Uh, that we, that's typically used. Uh, net radiation is one of the more dominating factors, and so we decided to focus on that. Uh, the energy balance, snow routine, and geisha, the original, 
uh, looked only at the air temperature and the snow temperature to calculate net radiation. It ignored shortwave radiation altogether. So we decided to improve upon the model and update it with including long wave radiation downward from clouds and vegetation, as well as include a short wave radiation model. And we also had to update the uh, long wave downward from the temperature. So the updates, uh, we, one thing that we're always considerate of is uh, there's not a lot of observation data in a lot of places we work. And so we used the solar constant to estimate the short wave radiation downward. And then we had a whole bunch of reduction factors uh, applied to it. The two that I want to talk about are the topographic shading and the aspect. Those made the largest difference. We also included a snow albedo model. And we also accounted for long wave radiation from clouds and canopy, as well as uh, elevation through the use of a lapse rate. Uh, we also uh, put in an interception and sublimation model uh, from Liston and Elder, the snow model. So when we're estimating the short wave radiation, we have the two sites, the lower and the upper elevation. As you can see, it's not perfect, but we do okay, especially that since the cloud data was 16 kilometers away. The, uh, the observed is in red and the simulated is in blue. So at both sites, did fairly well. And to take that and put it into the net radiation, we compared the original estimates of net radiation within the model to the updated. As you see, the original is in red, and that's pretty, it follows the temperature only because that's basically what's driving it. And there's not a whole lot of variation. In the updated, you see the net radiation varies quite a bit, especially towards the end when the albedo is dropping. Here's. Uh, the two point sites, uh, we compared the updated version of the model uh, at the two point sites. As you can see, there's only modest improvement at the point scale. Uh, and we also have in there the Snowtherm model, which came from Landry et al. Uh, that model is uh, one of the more physically based, I guess, energy balance models. Uh, but it was only run with uh, standard values. I don't think it was calibrated. So anyways, we're we're matching about the same. The updated version melts a little bit sooner than the original. And then, but when we look at the uh, spatial variability, so we have four locations within the basin uh, represented by the stars. We looked at north facing and south facing, as well as differences between forested and non-forested. We're seeing a lot of difference uh, in the snow water equivalent, which we didn't in the original model. All four of those locations would have been simulated as the same. So here's a simulation. Uh, this is just a water year. Uh, I think it's 2007 of the basin. And within this, you'll see that the snow accumulates first up at the uh, upper elevations. And throughout it, you'll see that the south facing uh, slope, which is on the right, uh, has less snow water equivalent uh, throughout the season than the north facing slope. So when we looked at the snow cover area, uh, once again, we had 31 images. I'm just showing uh, water year 2007 here. Uh, it's not perfect, but we're spatially representing the basin more accurately now. And this is really very few calibration parameters to do this. And so uh, the snow cover area is uh, looking better, but then how does that manifest in the snow or in the flow, the outflow? Once again, this is the original uh, channel flow. Uh, not doing so well, but with the updates, uh, we're matching the Nash Suit Cliff to, uh, I think it's 0.4, or yeah, 0.42. And this is a completely uncalibrated model. This is just standard values for all the parameters. So with calibration, probably improved quite a bit. But the timing and the peak flows are all, all improved. And so in conclusion, uh, inclusion of the topography and vegetation uh, within the energy balance simulation, uh, put modest improvements at the two SWE sites. But when you look at the basin as a whole, we're improving the spatial variability of the SWE, and that uh, in turn improves our outflow simulations. And also, overall better representation of the hydrologic processes within the basin. 
and the effect on modeling capabilities, we're better equipped to solve hydrologic related issues in snow dominated basins. And uh, the updated version better utilizes the distributed structure of the model. And there's no increase in forcing data required to run the model because we're uh, estimating, calculating the downward shortwave radiation. So that concludes my talk. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to. We have plenty of time for questions, so go ahead. Yes. That's a good question, and we were going to, but uh, now that we don't care as much about the Helmand River Basin, we're not running this model operationally anymore. That's a, yeah, I know that's a bad answer, but that's how it is. Any other questions? Could you, could you comment on the motivation for using the for this application? Sure. Uh, we looked at a lot of models. Uh, all the way from lump parameter all the way to fully distributed. Uh, we have experience in developing the Geisha model, and so we have the source code and we're familiar with it. Uh, and it was just a, at the time, it was a good uh, choice for running the basin. And it also has the supercomputing capabilities where we can run on lots of processors. Uh, and I think it's been mentioned a few times when you get into distributed physics based model, it gets bogged down a lot of times. So. Yeah, that's an excellent question. We haven't done, as far as the spatial distribution with drifting, we haven't done that yet. That's one area where we know we need to go. Uh, as far as precipitation, when we're using satellite derived, that's obviously spatial precip. But within the basin, there was only one precip gauge at the lower elevation. So that could be an area of error as well. And so, yeah, that, that's an area where we could improve as well. Yeah, yeah, both long wave and short wave radiation. Yeah, we, we did look at that, and the shortwave made the bigger difference, and that might be because the way we uh, put the long wave in, uh, it, it's not as counted for as much. But yeah, the shortwave made the bigger difference. Yeah. 